We're in a new area that I hinted at earlier in my last uh, little botany exploration video. Uh, we're currently, uh, our surficial geology, uh, we're currently on either Holocene or Pleistocene clay, and that uh, overlies a nice uh, bedrock uh, of Mississippian, uh, early Carboniferous shale. And I'm thinking it is uh, the earliest stage of the Carboniferous, the, uh, the Tornasian. I think it's the lower two thirds of the Tornasian and that makes up the bedrock that's underneath our clay. And that clay will come into play. I don't mean to rhyme, but that I do mean that. For the rest of the video, it will. But, uh, whew, got a little monarch over there. So, uh, you'll notice all the white in this field. This is it's completely inundated with um, Queen Anne's lace, uh, wild carrot. It's a Daucus carota. Uh, yeah, some of the umbels are drying up and turning into tumbleweeds like they do. But uh, let's see if we can get a good looking specimen. Yeah, so it's a bit later in the year. Uh, see, yep, that's Daucus Corota. You know, carrot family, obviously. But uh, check this out. You see all the uh, burrs on this dried up umbel right here? Yeah, that's where the seeds are, and that's how they get to places. They'll hitch a ride on any animals that come through here, including me, which, uh, not gonna lie, kind of a good evolutionary choice. Uh, <laughs> if you're everywhere, uh, that, Seems like a good plant. Got these nice leaves right here. Uh, I'm th I do think that uh, I'm pretty sure most of most parts, at least, at least some of the parts of these uh, of the Ducus corota, they're uh, mildly phototoxic, like their relatives, the invasive giant hogweed, which means that uh, if you brush up against these and light uh, gets onto the part that was affected by the brushing uh, on this plant you're going to get maybe some irritation and some redness. And uh, I've heard some sources talk about how you can actually like take one of the leaves and imprint it on your skin and leave it out in the sun. You'll get like a direct like red itchy print of the leaf on your skin. So, you know, I don't know who would try that. It doesn't sound like fun to me, especially because I have sensitive skin, but still God, they're everywhere. Okay. Oh, okay, that's cool. We can check this out too. So, okay. Uh, did I miss it? Oh, look at that. So right in the middle right there, uh, that dark red flower right in the middle that you find on all duck is corroded at some point in their development. Uh, that's, its sole purpose is to attract insects and get some pollination going. So you can get seeds like this that'll blow around on a tumbleweed and get everywhere. And, uh, it's good that it's a tumbleweed because uh, this design right here, this flower design, is it's perfect for being a tumbleweed. It's called a complex umbel, as opposed to a regular umbel. Uh, you can see all of those little uh, stems coming from an original point right there, which does make it an umbel, but it also makes it a compound umbel since there is an additional umbel on each end of the uh, stalks right here. Uh, yeah. Which I think would be, these would be, um, these littler stalks would be like a pedestal, and this would be the uh, penuncle right here. Yeah, look at that. Very nice. Yeah, you can see how, since there's a bunch of little flowers on the end of each of these sticks that already makes it an umbel, that therefore makes this a good example of a compound umbel in fluorescence. What I at least appreciate about coming out here, it's not really, like, the conditions aren't really that bad. They're pretty equitable, it's nice, and uh, there's a lot more organisms to look at. You know what they say, endless forms most beautiful. Pretty cool. I stole that from Darwin, don't tell him. I have to make my way over to the stars of the show. They are trees.
Yeah, these are some very basic, boring kind of flowers. Like, uh, there's clover, obviously. And then, uh, Delcus Corota. Which may be a little boring to some, but... I don't know. I'm not necessarily a big fan of the clovers, but they're kind of here to stay, unfortunately. Uh, what should we start off with first? Alrighty. Um, yeah, let's go over here. So uh, the stars of the show uh, today, they're going to be oak trees. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. And oak trees are really cool. Uh, they... They're good uh, examples of some evolutionary success. These ones, they're kind of inundated with galls, unfortunately. But, uh, you know. I think like 80% of gall wasps actually uh, parasitize oak trees. So, you know. They're quite reliant on them. And there's also like acorn weevils and other animals. That kind of fits the uh, biological rule of thumb that if you have a plant species, there's probably at least one animal probably an insect that relies on it and uh, i have i think i've come to a conclusion on what species this is exactly i mean i feel like it's obvious that it's at least an oak tree it's in the genus quercus it has an acorn that uh it bears acorns that won't focus another good indicator that it's an oak is the uh alternate leaf pattern right there let's see if i can bring it down to our level you see it goes on one and the other and then one and the other over there and those are alternating and they're going on uh, the alternate side it's different from uh, opposite where you have uh, two at the same level on one side and there's two others on the other uh, further down on the leaf not the leaf the uh, the axis of the branch further down the axis of the branch that uh, they face each other but in the opposite way but oaks are alternate and they have their alternate leaf pattern that makes them go uh, uh, back and forth and back and forth and not uh, facing each other one way and then facing each other the other way that's more characteristic of maples and I bring that up because there are oaks that have convergently evolved a maple like leaf kind of like what you see on the uh, flag of Canada uh, that's the species uh, Quercus acerifolia. I don't know if it's native to anywhere where I'm at. Uh, it doesn't matter. But still, you can tell the difference because oaks have alternate leaf patterns and then uh, maples have the opposite one. Maybe I can find a better example over here. Because uh, I'm not doing, I'm not necessarily doing a very good job. Um, let's see here. Oh, there we go. Look at that. You see that? So it's like one and then the other and then one and then the other, and they call all kind of cluster up at the end because they're growing off of a bud. But at any rate, so we know it's an oak for sure. I mean, the acorn made it kind of obvious, but still. Uh, we know that it is a red oak. It is in the subgenus. It's in the subgenus Quercus. It's in the genus Quercus, but it is in a taxonomic grouping known as a section. It is uh, the section known as Lobati. Uh, there are five sections in the subgenus Quercus. There's Quercus, there's Lobati, there's Pontiki, there is uh, Protobalanus, and there's Varentes, and then there's another subgenus, Ceres, which is in Europe and Asia, and that includes the sections Ceres, Ilex, and Cyclobalanopsis. Uh, but still, these are in the section Lobati. You can tell because lobes, obviously, but there's also these uh, bristly hair-like ends on the distal parts of the lobe right here. So it's in Lobati, that means it is in the group where, of uh, oaks that are known as red oaks. And uh, focus, please. So it's in the grouping, uh, the red oaks. But the problem with at least some red oak species is that some of them are quite similar to each other. So uh, one thing that I've used to classify them that has been helpful to me, hopefully we'll find a good example maybe over here down closer to the ground, uh, they're budding. So the thing about their budding, uh, in this case, the budding uh, forms kind of the buds that themselves form a like pentagonal, five-angled shape, like a pentagon. Here we go. Oh my gosh! Look at that. Here is a really good example of the alternate leaf pattern right here. Look at that. 
you can see one side and then the other one side and then uh, the other over here it's just drooping down a little bit right there and then same side again they get a little cluster here because it's at the tip of the bud the terminal axis of the leaf but still uh, we got to show you the buds because in this case they're five angled only would focus maybe out here they're more pentagonal shaped My eyes focus better than a camera, so I'll just verify that here. Yep, that's five angled right there, yep. There we go. Nice pentagonal shape there. So um, I'm pretty sure, uh, based off of how I classified it, that separates, that we've ruled out uh, Quercus palustris as the, a candidate for what this oak tree is. But then if we uh, look back at the buds again, uh, if the buds are largely uh, glabrous and there's uh, meaning that there's no like, no hair at the bottom, you can see some pubescence there uh, at the tip kind of looks like, but uh, the uh, bottom kind of looks like the rest of the uh, new wood here. And that, uh, and that really uh, rules out the black oak Quercus velutina as a candidate for what type of oak this is. There we go. Yeah, not a lot of uh, pubescence there. Not a lot of pubescence on that one either, at the bottom. If it's restricted to the, uh, the distal tip of the bud, that still counts, but uh, black oak buds are largely pubescent uh throughout the entire bud and that's not the case here obviously so uh, maybe another example here would be helpful get some leaves out of the way oh there we go look at that yeah it, it kind of covers up right there so that rules out um i think that rules out quercus velutina and we've uh, dipped our toes in a part of oak taxonomy that's like very uh, tentative. Like, th like <laughs> there are four red oaks that live in the area where I live where they're like nearly identical to each other. There is uh, Quercus coccinea, there's Quercus uh, ellipsoidalis, there's Quercus velutina, and there's I think also Quercus palustris. We've ruled out velutina and palustris, but still, like we're really getting into some aspects of oak taxonomy that are like really like hand wavy. So uh, <laughs> especially since they're so prone to hybridizing, and we'll talk about that later. Yeah, but regardless, like this is their, these are probably some of the most difficult oak species to identify out of all of them in this area at least but uh you know i think i've i think i'm on to something at least i have an acorn here uh right here so the difference between coccinia and uh ellipsoidalis is that uh, uh oh boy i really wish these focused better that'd be nice There we go. Look at that. Nice. Alrighty. So the main difference between uh, coccinia and ellipsoidalis, they lie in the acorns themselves. And uh, <laughs> I've had some real difficulty discerning what exactly is going on with what kind of acorns these are. So I'm really thinking that this is ellipsoidalis since uh, I think Quercus coccinia has a uh, much sharper looking and much, uh, much more angular looking scales on the cup of the acorn. And additionally, I have not really seen any uh, concentric pitting like you would find on coccinia on the bottom, on the apex of the fruit right here. Uh, but <laughs> when I looked a little more closely, I kind of like noticed something interesting. It's probably not gonna be visible here but it kind of looks like there is pitting, which is really strange. I don't know if that's present on all acorns, 
But in all the cases that I've seen, of uh, when I've looked at pictures of the pitting on the coccinia acorns, it is much more prominent. But I don't know if it's because it's like a different point of maturity. It's a little confusing. But uh, still, regardless from what I've read, uh, the coccinia pitting is a lot more common than what I have noticed on these acorns on this tree. And also, uh, there is a bit of, oh yeah, there is some glossiness on the uh, scales of this acorn here. But I am, oh wait, hold up. Yeah, maybe you can see that pseudo pitting maybe. I don't know if it's actual pitting or not. Maybe you can see that a little better. But I did find um, maybe a more mature example up in the tree when I was looking. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm thinking this is, uh, yeah, this is a lot more obvious. I'm thinking this is, uh, those are some very coccinia-like pitting rings right there. Let's see if we can find another example. Yeah. I mean, it could honestly just be a hybrid, and I'm barking up the wrong tree here. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, there's like, it really seems like there's pitting and some really quir quirkus uh, coccinia like traits here. But, uh, it's still like hard to discern. Uh, <laughs> the pits that I'm finding on these acorns themselves are pretty hard to discern. And I found a good looking acorn. Let's see if we can bring it down here. So I have read that, um, uh, Quercus uh, ellipsoidalis does occasionally have some infrequent instances of pitting on the acorns. And uh, I've also read that about what kind of soils that they prefer. So Quercus coccinia, uh, I think it's more versatile of an oak tree in terms of what soils it can uh, grow in compared to Quercus ellipsoidalis. Uh, I have heard that uh, some good examples of Quercus coccinia have been uh, growing on sandy soils, which doesn't make sense here, especially since uh, I talked about the surficial uh, substrate that we have here. Uh, it's some overlying clay, which doesn't really make sense. That's not sandy at all. So I did some further reading, and it seems that some of the best specimens of Quercus ellipsoidalis, which this seems like a best specimen of any oak tree, let's be honest here. The best specimens of Quercus ellipsoidalis uh, have actually been grown on well-drained clay soils, which I feel like that's very useful in terms of knowing like, oh, what kind of oak tree am I looking at? Because they're, uh, they're like ecologically refined in most instances to the point where it's, <laughs> it's probably a lot more telling what species it is depending on what kind of soil it's growing on than uh, looking at certain aspects of the plant itself, especially the leaves. Like I've looked at some classification schemes that involve like super refined details of uh, the oak leaves. And I feel like that's not necessarily a good idea, especially when they end up being inundated with like galls and they're very prone to changes in their morphology from sunlight. Yeah, that's, like this looks like it's been grown on here for a while and I really am not seeing any pitting. I'm led to believe that this is just an instance of infrequent pitting. There's a little bit, but it's really, it's really not noticeable despite how mature this acorn looks. So I'm really led to classify this oak tree as Quercus ellipsoidalis. Um, it is native here. It's just not very common, but regardless, it's very nice that something like this is here look right here this looks again I'm not really a big fan of using um, leaves to classify these organisms but still uh, you can see this uh, last lobe right here is about as long as the other middle lobes which kind of makes it also seem like it is a uh, Quercus ellipsoidalis right there yeah those are really nice though look how pretty they are like a nice uh, glossy forest green right there the bottom Actually, uh, it has some apical hairs, or hairs at the apex, where the uh, secondary veins meet the uh, midrib. See the hairs right there. A 
think I think I can zoom in even more. Yeah, nice. There's some little fuzzies in that in the kind of crotch of that secondary branch right here and this main branch right here. So uh, pretty interesting. I've had many uh, sleepless nights trying to figure out what exactly, what kind of oak tree this is. But based off what I'm looking at here, it really seems to be Quercus ellipsoidalis. And I, but regardless, I really wouldn't be surprised if it is inherited some traits from a Quercus coccinea or a hybrid that contained Quercus coccinea traits itself. If I do change my mind on what exact what species this is, uh, I will make another video and I'll let you know, or I'll even put something in the description. But uh, I am pretty set right now on it being Quercus ellipsoidalis. That just seems to be where the evidence points, particularly um, the soil it's growing on, uh, the pitting on the acorns not being very conspicuous, and also the. Uh, tips of the scales on the acorn not being that sharp you know I'll sh I can show that again it kind of looks like it forms a U in a lot of cases on this uh, on this acorn the tips of the scales right there they don't seem as pointed as they would be on uh, the acorn belonging to uh, Quercus coccinea so I'm really thinking this is ellipsoidalis and I even found an ellipsoid acorn in this tree uh, just a moment ago. Again, right there. Right there. There's a better example right there. Like I honestly really wouldn't be shocked if this was a hybrid of some sort, but I'm not gonna, I can't really bust out the, uh, I can't really bust out any machinery that would help me with that. So we'll just leave it at a Quercus ellipsoidalis. Check out this toad flax right here. You see this, look at that. Very unique flowers right here. This is toad flax. I don't know what's, uh, don't remember what family it's in or what clade it's in rather excuse me but uh yeah these are really nice and i can bring them up more in a future video i like these toad flex and uh with clades in mind uh i talked about oaks being in the genus quercus and i went through all their taxonomy uh briefly beforehand but uh it's important to know that uh the uh, oaks are in the beech family, Fagaceae. They're in the beech clade. I keep saying family, but I don't really like using that. We got ourselves a nice little clue at uh, about what other species we're going to be looking at. Here, uh, adjacent to the poison ivy, we have a little baby of uh, this bad boy right here. So let's get a branch down here to our view, and we'll check it out and classify it. So you have these, um, again, it's an oak. Uh, you've got the alternate leaf pattern, uh, but no bristles on the uh, distal ends of the lobes. Instead, you have these uh, rounded lobe ends. You got these rounded lobe ends right here, and they form very deep sinuses. Here's the bottom side right there and that uh, along with the bark that I'll show you right here you see it kind of has this uh, these uh, more bar like shapes but then they become much scalier looking uh, at the top half of the tree they're a lot more squamous they kind of look like shingles on a roof they're more scale like and they're especially noticeable on the branches right here. But it starts at the, uh, about halfway up the trunk. Much more scale-like than down here. 
And that lets you know, like that's that's textbook Quercus Alba. Like that's a classic Quercus Alba case. So we're dealing with the white oak, the North American white oak. Right here. Uh, let's get some closer looks at it though. So bringing this down, there are some acorns growing right there. Very nice, nice and yellow and unripe. Maybe some, uh, pu lots of pubescence. Yeah, lots of pubescence on the cups of the acorns on their scales. Um, there's some leaves right there. Uh, maybe not looking too good, but regardless, this is really interesting right here. You see that little, uh, it kind of looks like a crappy dollar store toy. That right there, that belongs to a species of gall wasp. I'm pretty sure they frequent this species of oak itself, the white oak right here. So really there's a baby uh, wasp larva growing in there. Uh, there are these insects called gall wasps and uh, what they do essentially is they lay their eggs in the leaves and we actually don't know why or how this happens, but it causes maybe a sort of defense mechanism in the plant that makes like a swelling and a gall that surrounds the larva and actually ironically allows it to grow and be safe until maturity where it can exit the gall. But if we come back to this, uh, the funny looking gall that we had earlier, right here, I'll bring it down, maybe make it a little easier to see. There's one right there, one right there. There's another smaller one right there. But, uh, oh, there might be more of them. Yeah, there's another one. It doesn't matter though. This is a pretty good specimen. So this is, this belongs to the, um, the hedgehog gall wasp. And we use stuff like that because frankly, it's easier to classify the species based off of the gall it makes than the wasp itself. And it looks like a hedgehog. It's spiny like a hedgehog. Uh, it's the hedgehog gall wasp. I think it's um, Ascrapius erinaceae. And uh, as is true of most other gall wasps, they heavily rely on just oak trees for their reproduction. Where'd you go? There you go. He went out of shot because of the wind. Right there. Yeah, so it's an interesting example, a further example of uh, animals heavily relying on plants, particularly flowering plants, uh, since this is, um, this is obviously a post, or rather maybe even during, no post, uh, we'll say post. It's a post uh, Cretaceous terrestrial revolution uh, plant which means that you're going to have like a well-established foundational plant with animals relying on it and sometimes even having to live on it for at least a part of their life. Very nice. But um, what's interesting, we're noticing a phenomenon here, all right? So the fascinating thing is we have two oaks from two different North American lineages and they're gigantic but they're also sharing the same habitat at the same time. So <laughs> that's actually a reflection of how oaks themselves are a great evolutionary success. And I can go into that. Based off of some uh, pollen fossils in Austria at the Paleocene-Eocene boundary 56 million years ago, uh, we know that by that time, oaks in the genus Quercus had evolved. Uh, the Paleocene, the Eocene, that boundary right there, that is post non-avian dinosaurs going extinct. We are dealing with a world during the Paleocene, Eocene uh, thermal maximum. Temperatures are very high, uh, year-round temperatures above freezing, even at the poles. Uh, and these would have originated at least in the northern hemisphere in uh, Laurasia. Laurasia separated by now, but um, we aren't necessarily sure if uh, Asian oaks gave rise to uh, future Asian oaks and the rest of the American lineages or vice versa. It's just best to say that these are a northern hemisphere originated tree type from the uh, uh, beech clade, uh, Fagaceae. So, Very early on, we have uh, the division of uh, these oak trees into their main types. For example, um, 
within about 10 million years of the uh, early Eocene uh, climatic optimum, which was um, that itself, I think it ran from about like 50-ish to about uh, a little over 40 million years ago, and it would be within 10 million years of that, which means it was uh, a little bit afterwards. So let's say like uh, over 35 million years ago. Uh, that's when that's when we know for sure that um, major oak sections, particularly uh, Quercus, Lobati, Cyclobalanopsis, and maybe Ilex are being well established and they originated by then. And we're being well established in the geographic distribution as they are today. Uh, we do know for sure in um, I think maybe as early as 48 million years ago, we have uh, fossil examples of one section, Cyclobalanopsis. They're the ring cups oaks. And uh, we can discern that based off of a fossil acorn that we found. But at any rate, this continues, uh, this diversification continues. Uh, oaks are becoming very prevalent. And then along comes the uh, Quaternary Ice Age episodes. So this starts about two, two and a half million years ago. And this is when you have major glaciation episodes starting. Um, we'll focus on the North Poles, the North Pole. Uh, you have uh, glaciation coming down and <laughs> going down, I think at the absolute maximum, like it's starting to get close to Florida. That's how far down those, uh, that's how far down those uh, glaciers could have been. Uh, probably a bit higher, but it, like, it would make Florida like colder than it is now, which is kind of insane. But still, uh, because it's like mass glaciation that's lowering sea levels, that's uh, causing some interchange of some organisms as we have glac glacial episodes uh, turning on and off through this two and a half million year period. Uh, we're actually currently in the middle of a uh, glacial recession. Uh, roughly uh, 12,000 years ago, uh, our glaciers had gone back up to the North Pole, and we were in a so-called ice age. But that means that um, in a lot of cases, you're going to have some uh, migration of uh, trees, like oaks, uh, back to new areas now that they aren't being eviscer like eviscerated and killed off by glaciers being excessively, excessively cold. And that all, that booming success and that quick migration, that all plays into uh, four main reasons why oaks are such an evolutionary success. So firstly, uh, based off of studies of the genetic code of various oak species uh, in their populations, we know that large amounts of heritable variety are sequestered within small taxonomic groupings of oaks within populations or within species. They hold a large amount of variation within just, even just their populations. And I can link a study in the description where I got this from. It's called Oaks and Evolutionary Success. It gets into the nitty gritty. It explains the details about how exactly oaks have been able to do this well. So First, large amounts of variation sequestered within small taxonomic groupings in the oaks uh, in groups as small as evolutionarily significant populations and also species. Uh, additionally, I hinted at this earlier, you have, um, you have rapid migration rates in Europe. I think some migration rates were measured to be in oaks were measured to be faster than in the migration uh, rates of animals like jays and rodents, which is insane. That's incredibly fast migration, which I would imagine could be facilitated by their wind pollination because they have an inflorescence called a catkin, that's the male flower, and the catkins, uh, they distribute their pollen by wind. Uh, there's also female flowers on oaks too, but I'm not gonna get to that too much. Uh, and also their acorns are highly coveted by lots of animals some that's like their sole diet or like a large aspect of their diet and they're gonna be taking it with them to places and maybe they'll forget them and that just increases their range by so much more so you have rapid migration rates and this is especially noticeable uh, in places like Europe 
uh, post ice age, post glacial recession. And in these migration situations, there's actually a lot of instances where oaks are being benefited by being the first ones there. They're getting some adaptive benefits that enable them to survive in their new environment better because of priority. So thirdly, you have large amounts of adaptation to uh, specific ecological niches, ecological guilds in an environment within clades of oaks. And you also have large amounts of convergent evolution across clades. So essentially what's going on is that uh, you have large amounts of adapt adaptation and adaptive divergence within oak clades and you have large amounts of convergent evolution regarding those adaptations across clades. So essentially you have representatives from each oak lineage that have independently found a way to solve one ecological problem which means that when two oak lineages come together, they can actually live together very well. Like these two lineages right here, you have Lobati represented by Quercus ellipsoidalis, and you have Quercus represented by uh, Quercus alba. So you have a white oak and you have a red oak over there. So you have representatives of two very prominent exemplary North American lineages and essentially a part of their evolutionary history is that they both originated and diverged in the north um and they both uh in sympatry and sympatry means at the same place in the same time in sympatry they split around the rocky mountains adapting to environments as they went down uh, different uh differing degrees of longitude and they ended up meeting back up in southern texas in the Mexic in Mexico and that's where you see incredibly large amounts of diversity because not only have these two oak species adapted to each other and adapted to the same environmental problems independently because they're they've already diverged as different lineages but now they're in a part they're in Mexico where there are lots of mountains where they are able to adapt to surviving on mountains and they can evolve a lot of diversity because there's an increasing amount of altitude and that enables large amounts of space to be taken up by these oaks and many different mini environments for oak species to adapt to and become their own new species and speciate. They're becoming geographically isolated because they're on different levels of elevation that other populations may not be able to survive as well on. So essentially you have a good example of these two lineages here, Quercus and Lobati. Uh, basically double dipping in their ecological niches, which increases their diversity twofold because you have two lineages. We also see that example in Europe, but there isn't any sympatry. A really good example is the explosive radiation of a species of American white oak that somehow got into Europe. It is Quercus robur. It looks a lot like Quercus alba, but uh, again, European species, it does very well there anyway but uh that we have multiple examples of some explosive radiation that has to do with changes in elevation and one of the examples also is cyclobalanopsis there is some radiation some adaptive radiation where there's large amounts of diversification in the clade because of uplift of the tibetan pa uh, plateau eight million years ago and yeah the himalayas and their uh, uplift from india crashing into the asian tectonic plate uh caused more uh, elevation in that area and more places for cyclobalanopsis to diversify. Final contributor to oak evolutionary success is their um, their extensive hybridization and introgression. So introgression introgression is essentially um, hybridization between populations, particularly between species, uh, followed by frequent back crossing. You're crossing back into each other's um, gene pools. And uh, contrary to what some biologists may think uh, that may not be as familiar with plants, uh, this may seem like a downfall to them and that may seem like something that's deleterious being hybridizing a lot. But of course, uh, <laughs> it's more complex than that. And 
essentially what you're dealing with is what is known as a syngamion. A syngamion is um, a grouping of populations where there's extensive hybridization and that contributes their prosperity actually despite that happening and despite the conventional wisdom that hybridization is always not very good in nature, especially after species divergence. For example, um, Quercus alba, uh, at least around where I live, it uh, forms a syngamion with some prominent examples including Quercus macrocarpa, the burr oak, and uh, the post oak, Quercus stellata. Actually, no, it's not Quercus stellata, it's Quercus macrocarpa and Quercus bicolor. I think there is a little bit of contribution with uh, Quercus stellata, but the main groups of the syngamion are Quercus alba, Quercus uh, macrocarpa, and Quercus bicolor. And I think there are examples of these around where I live, so we can check those out later. But yeah, the, uh, these are really just some evolutionarily successful trees. 56 million years of history paying off a lot. They, I guess, sort of won the genetic lottery. Lots of diversity within the populations. Uh, they're able to migrate very quickly. Uh, additionally, <laughs> their evolutionary history and how they've split and migrated around geographical boundaries uh, along with the areas where they're around means that you're having multiple lineages developing independently developing ways to survive the same types of ecosystems which means that eventually you can have multiple lineages living together in one area like we see here And when they finally come to an area after having this established uh, sympatry and, uh, together and they're in an area now where there's a new factor that can increase their diversity, they're just going to explode. And that's the case in Mexico. I think something like 40% of oak species are actually in Mexico. And uh, that's fueled by their ability to basically do twice as much or however many times as much uh, dabbling in one uh, ecological guild in their ecosystem relative to other types of trees. And that's contributed to there being like 435 species in the genus Quercus. The only uh, rivals that they have in the amount of tree species are like the genus Salix willow. but. Yeah, they're only like 400 species, but 435 species is a lot. And finally, that also uh, has been contributed to by their ability, the oak's ability to like not go extinct after doing large amounts of hybridization and introgression. And that essentially sums up how they've come so far over these past 56 million years and how they've been able to do so well. I would consider every organism that's ever been around to be an evolutionary success at least to some extent but uh i mean obviously in some cases it's more obvious than others but by those means you technically are an evolutionary success too so uh act like